Thank you, Brian. In depth this morning, span safety. How safe are our local bridges? That is the question being raised after the Florida Department of Transportation released a new report last week. It revealed that hundreds of bridges around the state are considered either structurally deficient or functionally obsolete. Consider this. On a scale of 100, the report rates the bridge carrying University Boulevard North over the Arlington River, that one right there, a 7. The Magnolia Street span over Long Branch Creek scored an 8, and those are just two of 17 bridges in Duval County listed as structurally deficient. So is there cause for concern? Dr. Adel El Safdi is a UNF civil engineering professor joining us with more on your take on this report. Good morning to you. Hi. So when you hear on a scale of 100 that some of these bridges rate a 7, that is certainly alarming. Does that mean that all traffic should cease and desist on that bridge? No, absolutely not. Uh, we just need to point out that uh, we have over 600,000 bridges in the U.S. and 12% of these bridges are classified as structure deficient, which is something like 73,000, over 73,000 bridges. But this should not be alarming because this classification itself is just telling us that it is not unsafe, but it requires some sort of either repair or replacement. So it's just a measure of uh, telling that the structure is just going some sort of measurable strains, measurable distress, but not necessarily unsafe. With all due respect, when you tell me that it may need to be replaced, I'm thinking, well, the sooner the better, and that signals danger to me. Usually they do some sort of inspection every two years, and if there is any need for further inspection, they just go ahead and just do it every six months or a year. And if there is any need for that bridge to be replaced or repaired, the Department of Transportation are obliged to stop the traffic and do not allow any traffic on that. So we just need to uh, be assured that the Department of Transportation is looking into that and they're doing this inspection. They inspect the bridge itself on the top and the bottom, the substructure and the superstructure, and they even go to the underwater inspection to check the foundation if there's any peer, uh, peer scouring or not. Mm -hmm. So they're doing a great job as far as just making sure that all these bridges are sound and safe. So the wording itself or the terminology of the structure deficient should not be alarming. It's more of a terminology to make sure that this bridge is eligible for federal funding if they require some sort of uh, rep repair. You order. bring that up. But there's a big cost issue, too, talking about replacing and repairing bridges, is it not? I mean, it costs millions of dollars. Absolutely. We have a multi-billion dollar investment in our bridges in the U.S., and to preserve this investment, we need to have, and the, we are having, continuous kind of check, continuous inspection, and we are fighting against like a relentless, aggressive environmental attack, which is one factor, meaning the corrosion of the sea reinforcement, corrosion of the bearings, and we have other kinds of poor workmanship, poor design, and poor construction, and poor maintenance. All of these factors are playing a role in attacking our bridges and infrastructure in general. And, and making sure that they remain safe for years Absolutely. to come. I mean, you talk about a lot of the environmental hazards as well to these bridges. And, and we know in Minneapolis, the, the mighty Mississippi River may have played a role in uh, perhaps undermining that bridge structure right there. And you see that horrific video as that just comes crashing down. Dr. Adel El Safti from UNF's Civil Engineering Department, thank you so much for thank giving you, us sir. your input on the safety issue. It's a Jacksonville landmark, a symbol of our city. But tonight, First Coast News has found a secret within the Riverwalk. A problem far worse than we've ever known. Any failure that is involving a uh, column or footing, that's scary. We should be uh, alarmed about that. The news continues with First Coast News at 6. Good evening, everyone. I'm Shannon Ogg. And I'm Donna Hicken in for Jeannie. We start now with an investigation you will only see here on First Coast News, rethinking the Riverwalk. Our investigators have uncovered evidence of potentially dangerous problems left unfixed for years. This segment of the Riverwalk was just shut down this past December. Loose bricks made the walkway and road unsafe. Tonight, we know that wasn't the first sign of trouble. Engineers first alerted the city about the damage in the Riverwalk five years ago in 2002. Then in 04, inspectors found more wear and tear on the structure's underside and said it could fail if it wasn't fixed. At that time, public works officials told us they had a couple of years before things started to be a concern. First Coast News' Grayson Com is live on the North Bank tonight. And Grayson, the worry's been out there, but this is really the first time we're seeing just how bad it's become. 
Donna, it ended up taking this report, which we obtained with a bold warning to lure construction crews out here. It calls on the city to take prompt corrective action, and it lists a number of support pilings with problems underneath the street and sidewalk. Here's the report put together for the city and state by an engineering firm. Every black dot is a piling under the water. Every dot with a number or note by it is a piling with a problem. Dr. Adel El Safti is a civil engineering professor at UNF. He says it's tough to tell how close the structure came to collapsing, but it's clear the city had to move quickly when the sidewalk first shifted. But what I can tell you for sure is that any failure that is involving a uh, column or footing, that's scary. We should be uh, alarmed about that. The city knew some trouble lurked under this nearly 50-year-old structure after an inspection in 2002. The public works chief says the city's been saving up for an in-depth study ever since, and he insists there was no clear danger until the sidewalk shifted and this report came out six weeks ago. That three pilings were broken there, that was a, basically a surprise to the city. There was nothing that indicated that we were going to have a problem such as this come up this quickly. The sidewalk and road have been shut down ever since. Temporary fixes were finished today. So the bridge was supporting the weight. I don't think there was any time that anyone it was even in danger of it falling. And keeping the public safe, e safe into the future will mean a complete and probably costly repair job for many of the problem pilings and the pavement they hold up. An engineering company is studying just how to do it. Right now, no estimate on how long it'll take or how much it'll cost. Live on the North Bank, Grayson Com, First Coast News, your news leader. All right, Grayson, thanks very much. And now with those temporary repairs on the North Bank now wrapped up, the road there is scheduled to reopen once the debris is all cleared. That probably will be sometime late next week. The city tells us the Riverwalk itself, though, will stay closed until engineers can be certain it is safe. The key is, is it uh, that the foundation recognized that uh, the learning techniques for students today are changing and we had to get involved in that in teaching upcoming architects and engineers in a more hands-on type of environment and so we've developed these studios we want them across the country so we get a uh, spread throughout the architectural and engineering community of teaching the future architects and engineers what concrete and particularly precast, pre-stressed concrete can do. PCI is on the leading edge of how education is changing for architects. Architecture is so complex, there's so many different components that an architect has to understand. There's no way that he or she can really wrap her arms around that without the help of industry. And so we're getting in at the ground floor and making all of these students who are going to be some of the leading architects of the country in just a few years, advocates for using our product. One of the beautiful aspects of this design studio is that it's giving an opportunity for the students to really get in touch with consultants and be involved in designing real world structures and designing complex problems and find solutions for it and getting interacting with actual designers who are doing that in the field and learning more and more about this. So instead of just getting the theory from a professor on some applications, they are really getting the real design and real experience from experts that have been working in the field for 20 and 30 years. The students are more interested in uh, how things are done rather than just the book learning of it. Uh, they're interested in, in the things that can be done. They're interested in coming into our plants and seeing how we produce the concrete. What is uh, the processes that we use? What are the processes that work? What are the processes that don't work? We were so fortunate to have this kind of collaboration uh, with an industrial partner, uh, Gate Concrete, and uh, we wanted to have that for years. And finally our dream came true when uh, Gate Concrete gave us the opportunity so that we can start this design studio that's building an intellectual connection between the industry and the academia. I would love to see a studio at every architecture school in the country. It would give us the credibility that we need to really advance our products, make architects more interested in the product, and create these champions outside of our industry, these advocates for precast, and we can dot the nation 
with different advocates, really coming up with new ideas, new ways of using precast, and people who really understand the product as well. I think that's a great future for us.